The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of the human being and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Are you excited? I don't think you're as excited as I am. I'm pretty excited. This has just been an incredible experience, going through the upgrades, all of the work. Countless, countless people have participated to make this happen. Uh, so grateful for our facility upgrade team. Um, they, they work tirelessly, seriously, tirelessly. You have no idea the amount of time that they spent working to upgrade this space and, and, and bring it to what we're seeing and experiencing today. We had 26 contractors, 26 contractors participate in, in, in making this space look the way it is and sound the way it is. Uh, we're still working with some of them. We have experts in the sound booth right now helping to get the sound just right. They're going to be teaching and training folks here on, on how to do it. Uh, the painters were brilliant. I mean, it, everything was just done so well with such quality. And, and it was fun, you know, hearing stories about some of the contractors who, who saw the work that they're doing here as holy work, important work, work not that, that they're just doing their jobs, they're, they're serving God by how they participated in this space. Uh, I'm so grateful uh, for everything that's happened and I can't wait for all that lies ahead. Did you know that, that we have been growing even through the summer? New people have been coming all summer long. Did you know that? Isn't that wonderful? Our worship attendance has been climbing. Our giving, our generosity has been going up through the summer. Thank you, God. I mean, that's just, that's remarkable. I mean, I've been a pastor a long time and I've never seen that happen before. That's a really terrific thing. And, uh, you know, th this space, as I was telling the children, the space is important. We've got to have good space, good sound, uh, beauty that, that helps to connect us to God. But, but it's not the space that's the most important thing. It's what happens in this space. That's the most important thing. It would break my heart if any human walked through these doors and didn't experience love, didn't experience acceptance, didn't experience inclusion. It doesn't matter who people are. It doesn't matter their ethnicity. It doesn't matter their religious background. It doesn't matter their, their sexuality or their gender. None of those things matter because we're all children of God. And every single person who comes into this space deserves love, deserves respect, deserves to be treated as a child of God. All of us walk into this space wounded. That's reality. We're all wounded people. Amen? We're all broken. Did you know that when a baby is born, for the first three to nine months, that infant still believes that it's attached to its mother. Did you know that? Did you know that? I, that's a new, new learning for me. But a baby, an infant, still believes it's attached to its mother. But somewhere between three and nine months... This realization happens in every single person, every single human. It's part of our development. This realization occurs that we're not attached anymore. We're suddenly in this world on our own. 
We don't have the comfort of that physical attachment. And, and, and when that, that trauma happens, it's a trauma that happens in every single young human, it creates a wound. And the wound could be estrangement. The wound could be abandonment. The wound could be betrayal. And as we grow as people, we often we're, we're unaware of those wounds. And when somebody says a mean thing or somebody uh, puts us down or, or, or some, some other thing happens to us, often that wound gets touched and, and it, it's made worse. And we start hiding our wounds. We, we don't want to look at our wounds. When we certainly don't want other people to know about our wounds. And, but when they get touched, we act out sideways. We hurt others. We isolate. We self-medicate. Every single human has this. Every single human being has this level of wounding. And I think what Jesus was about is he could see the wounds in people. He could see the woman at the well or the leper or even the soldiers who drove the nails through his hands and his feet. And he showed them compassion. He understood they were hurting. He understood that, that they hadn't been able to, to deal with their wounding. They, there was nothing they could do to address their wounding until they met him. And they, they, they met his deep love and compassion and gentleness and forgiveness. You see, I think this is who Jesus is calling us to be. In this text today, he says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, that's weird. You know, that's weird. And it's no, no, uh, not a surprise that the folks who were standing there said, that really doesn't make any sense. But I think what Jesus was saying is, is he was saying, what, what, what we need to do is we need to be filled up with Jesus. We need to be filled up with the Christ. You see, he wasn't just speaking as one guy in Palestine. He was speaking as the Christ. In the Gospel of John, which the text came from today, it starts out by saying, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, not one thing came into being. What came into being through him was life. You see, the Christ is about life, full life, complete life. Anytime you see life, you're looking at the Christ. Anytime you see anything that's living, and, and believe me, the earth is alive, right? The cosmos is alive. Anytime we see anything that's alive, we're looking at the Christ. When you, when you see another human, regardless of what they've done in their lives, regardless of how they've acted, you're looking at the Christ, and so what Jesus is saying is, is fill yourselves up with me, with my love, compassion, gentleness, forgiveness, mercy, service, generosity, and share that with the world. Share that everywhere you go. Blessings aren't meant to be kept to ourselves. Blessings are meant to be shared for the sake of the world. And the eternal life that we were hearing about in this passage isn't about going to heaven after we die. I know the church has kind of taught that for centuries, eons, that it's all about where we go after we die. But Jesus didn't really talk about that. It's really life into the ages is how that's written in the Greek. Life into the ages. What God cares about is the perpetuation of life. That life is sustained and perpetuated from generation to generation to generation. And we get to be the ones who are participating in the building, sustaining, and perpetuating of life. Last summer, last June, a year ago, I was in the Holy Land with a group from Abiding Hope. And, and it was a powerful experience for me. But there was one moment where I had a really strong spiritual experience that gave me a new perspective. I don't know if you've ever had spiritual experiences like this. But we were in um, the church in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, the Garden of Gethsemane is the place where after the Last Supper, Jesus went out there with his disciples. It was nighttime, it was dark, and he prayed. And he said, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. You familiar with that? You, you've heard that before? Well, I had always interpreted that text to mean he was praying not to be crucified, right? Right? That, that he was saying to God, I don't want to be crucified. I don't want to go to the cross. Which the more I, th I think about it now, really doesn't make sense. Because he's the one who told all the disciples, we're going to Jerusalem and they're going to crucify me. 
So why would he be praying not to be crucified when the whole time he was saying, I'm going to be crucified? But that's the way I had learned it. That's the way I had believed what, what I believed that text meant. But when I was at the Garden of Gethsemane in this church, there's this big rock up by the altar of this, this church. And they say, that's the rock that Jesus prayed on. Well, I don't know if it's the real rock, you know. There weren't historians following him around saying, hey, somebody put a white X on that rock. We'll come back to that later, you know. I, I don't know if it was the real rock. But I do know that pilgrims have been going there for thousands of years to pray over that rock. So it has energy. You can feel it. So I got down on my knees and I put my hands on that rock. And I just quieted myself. And what came to me was a different meaning of what Jesus was praying. Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. He wasn't asking to be spared from the crucifixion. He wasn't asking to be spared from pain. The sense I got was when he said, take this cup from me, he was saying, I've done all I can do. I've poured my whole life out. I've given everything I have. It's now time for others to bear the cup. It's now time for others to be filled up with love and life and to share that with the world. My time has ended. It's time for you. And I believe that's what it means to be the church. What it means to be the church is not that we're simply here to dispense religious goods and services. That's not why we're here. We're here to be the cup. We're here to be filled up with love and grace and peace and mercy and hope and joy and to pour that out for the sake of the world. Our world's messed up right now. We all know that. There's anxiety and fear, depression. There's there's polarization. There's, There's political divisiveness and meanness and cruelty and hatred, rage that's happening in our world today. It's broken. We're not going to fix the world with military. We're not going to fix the world with government. We're not going to fix the world with economic systems. The only thing that's going to create life is love. It's the stuff of Jesus. When those soldiers drove those nails through his hands and his feet, he didn't wound back. He didn't attack back. He loved them. He forgave them. He prayed for them. And on the third day when God raised Jesus from the dead, he wasn't just resuscitating a dead Palestinian Jew. He he was resurrecting the world. He was creating a new humanity. And we are that new humanity. A humanity that has been resurrected and, and, and restored to live fully as the children of God we're created to be. And I believe the world needs this message right now. The world needs a community of people who get this at a deep level. The world needs people who are inspirited with God to go and and live this love everywhere we go. So we come here not to do ministry. We come here to be filled up. We come here to get our cup full of love and grace and life so that we can go to our homes, our schools, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, the grocery store, wherever we go, and share that love. Ministry happens out there. It happens wherever you go. You are the ministers of this congregation. You are the disciples of Jesus. You are children of God. And God is asking us to be that community. Now, here's the thing. It's not easy. It's not easy to love at the level of Jesus. But we can Because he believes in us. He fills us. He said, as the Father sent me, so now I send you. He told his disciples, you'll do greater things than I ever did. Do you know why? Because he was just one. How many are we? He was one. How many are we? Are you ready to be the church? Do you want to be the church in the world? Do you want to be part of what God is doing in our world? Can you sense the presence of the Holy Spirit? Can you sense that God is up to something? Can you? I can. I can. And I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of what God's doing to create new life in this community and beyond. You are blessed. You are blessed beyond measure. 
The blessings aren't intended to be kept to ourselves. They're meant to be shared for the sake of all. So I look forward to what the Spirit has in store for us. But I know God's up to something tremendous. May we all say yes to, be, to living fully as the children of God we're created to be so that all people may experience real life in Jesus' name. God loves each of you, and I do too. Amen.